stand as people living in the last days. But at the same time, it is a message that is not easy to hear. So we're just going to ask God to kind of be with us as we, as we present this message for God to use me to be his mouthpiece. Dear God, I would like to uh, thank you for, for uh, the opportunity that we can meet here today in the Jinjin Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we thank you for uh, the history that you've given us uh, within our own church that we can learn from and that we can uh, get ourselves ready for, uh, for your second coming. And we ask that uh, you use me now uh, as your mouthpiece and uh, not in my power, let it be in your power. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I have to ask you a question. How many of you have heard of the 1888 message? Oh, we have a few. Excellent. Excellent. Now, we also know that uh, you know, our church historically has rejected that message in the early 1900s. And as a result, the delay of Jesus' second coming has occurred to this day. So we're going to go and discuss a little bit about the context of this message, and then we're going to go to talk about this message, what it actually means, and why is it so important for us today. Okay? So, Malcolm uh, has equipped me here with some uh, technology stuff, so let's see how we go. Ah, oh, here we go. Perfect. So, I would like to start off with, uh, with a passage from Testimonies to Ministers, page 91. This is what it says. The Lord, in His great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands, that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a large measure. Now, can I just ask you, we are Seventh-day Adventists, what do we usually say? What is our message to preach to the world? Three angels' messages. Well, this is what we are going to be talking today is the third angel's message. So is it something important that we should be uh, preaching to the world? Yes. Yeah, okay. So now, for those who, who actually have studied the prophecy, what happens soon after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and uh, after the letter rain and the loud cry. What happened soon after that? The persecution comes and soon after Jesus comes. So this is basically telling us this is right before Jesus comes. This is actually what's supposed to happen. So if this message is supposed to be proclaimed with a loud voice and with a large measure of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then the question that we need to ask ourselves, at the end of 2022, almost 2023, has this happened yet? The answer is no. It hasn't happened yet. We are still giving the message, but we are not demonstrating that message as described in Revelation chapter 18, which leads us to the obvious conclusion that something went wrong with the 1888 message when it was preached. So... If you look at the, the history, when this message was preached from about 1888 to uh, about 1900 by these two gentlemen, which is E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones, we, we can see that throughout that period, the message was being rejected and also the messengers were being rejected at the same time. And this is what, uh, what Ellen White says in Selected Messages, Volume 1. By exciting... By exciting the opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. And then in letter 51, 1895, she also says, God has given Brother Jones and Brother Wagner a message for the people. When you reject the message borne by these men, you reject Christ, the giver of the message. Now, this is some pretty, pretty strong words, isn't it? Now, how many, how many of us have actually 
previously kind of we, we go to pray and we pray God please give us the Holy Spirit have you prayed for that I hope we all have prayed for that because we definitely need it yet by rejecting this message we have actually delayed that outpouring of the Holy Spirit which is interesting now, notice what Ellen White says in 1902. I have been instructed that terrible experience at the Minneapolis Conference, that's the 1888 General Conference, is one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believers in the present truth. And that's when we come to the 1901 General, 1901 General Conference. This was basically the last opportunity for the people of that time in that era to accept that message. And this is what uh, Ellen White says on January 5, 1903 addressed to the Battle Creek Church. That's where the conference, 1901 conference, was, uh, was held. I'm going to read this. You can read it for yourselves. In the Eight Testimonies, page 104 and 105, you can read it yourself. But this is kind of like interesting. One day at noon, I was writing of the work that might have been done at the last general conference if the men in positions of trust had followed the will and way of God. Those who have had great light have not walked in the light. The meeting was closed and the break was not made. Men did not humble themselves before the Lord as they should have done, and the Holy Spirit was not imparted. I had written thus far when I lost consciousness, and I seemed to be witnessing a scene in Battle Creek. We were assembled in the auditorium of the tabernacle. Prayer was offered. A hymn was sung. A prayer was again offered, similar to what we do today in church services, don't we? We pray, we sing, we pray. Most earnest supplication was made to God. The meeting was marked by the presence of the Holy Spirit. The work went deep, and some present were weeping aloud. One arose from his bowed position and said that in the past he had not been in union with certain ones, and he felt no love for them. But now he saw himself as he was. With great solemnity, he repeated the message to the Laodicean church. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, in my self-sufficiency, this is just the way I felt, he said. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I now see that this is my condition, he said. My eyes are opened. My spirit had has been hard and unjust. I thought myself righteous, but my heart is broken, and I see my need of the precious counsel of the one who has searched me through and through. The speaker then turned to those who had been praying and said, We have something to do. We must confess our sins and humble our hearts before God. He made heartbroken confessions and then stepped up to several of the brethren one after another, and extended his hand, asking forgiveness. Those to whom he spoke sprang to their feet, making confession and asking forgiveness as well, and they fell upon one another's necks, weeping. The spirit of confession spread through the entire congregation. It was a Pentecostal season. God's praises were sung, and far into the night, until nearly morning, the work was carried on. No one seemed to be too proud to make heartfelt confession. And those who led in this work were the ones who had influence, but had not before had the courage to confess their sins. Now, let me ask you, have you ever been part of such a meeting like that? I have to say, I haven't. Where everybody was crying and weeping and saying, I need to make uh, some confessions, I need to ask for forgiveness for my brothers and sisters in the church. There was rejoicing such as never before had been heard in the tabernacle. And then this is what Ellen White says. There was, uh, then I aroused from my unconsciousness and for a while could not think where I was. My pen was still in my hand. The words were spoken to me. This might have been. All this the Lord was waiting to do for his people. All heaven was waiting to be gracious. And then she concludes and says, I thought of where we might have been had thorough work been done at the last general conference. And agony of disappointment came over me as I realized what I, what I had witnessed was not the reality. Now, isn't that sad, though? Yeah. What could have been? So, the 1888 message, we are going to go now into it and actually discuss what it actually is. What does it mean? How can we practically 
you know, uh, you know, implement, you know, what God is trying to teach us here. But if you actually look at historically, even to this day, significant efforts have been made to undermine the history of 1888 message. If you actually dig deep into it, you will see that there has been a lot of efforts where, you know, people would be quoting somebody who wasn't even alive during then, and then somebody comes after them, and they keep on quoting each other as they write the books rather than actually going back to the source. It's a lot of stuff. If we just talked about the history, we would need at least an hour and a half just about the history, but we are not going to go there today. So... In the book Gospel Workers, Ellen, Ellen White writes, the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. Now, Satan was angry when this message was first preached. He is still angry now when this message is preached. Because why? How many of us have sins that we have been struggling with over years and we still want to overcome and we have the good intentions but we are still struggling? Many of us have it, don't we? Yet, what the, what, uh, what the prophet is saying here is if actually we take this message, if we hear this message, Satan's power would be broken. And also in the next paragraph she says, if we would have the spirit and power of the third angel's message, we must present the law and the gospel together for they go hand in hand. Now, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, completes the third angel's message, and after the warnings have been given, we have this, uh, verse 12, this is what it says. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So my question to you is, when was the last time you heard the sermon about the faith of Jesus? I don't know, it's been a while, but commandments... Quite a bit. So, in connection with this message, there is another angel found in Revelation 18, verse 1, and it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. This angel is joining the angel of the third angel's message. And why do you think it's so important that the whole earth was lightened with the glory of the angel? We're going to find out today. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 5. And you can read it following your Bible, so you can follow on the screen. I've got the King James Version uh, on, on the screen. It says this, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Light up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then abundance, sorry, then thou shalt see and flow together and thy heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. So the sea is in prophetic language means people, yeah? So this is saying, when this message, when the glory of the Lord is lighting the whole world, it says, all those people who are unconverted, let's call them the Gentiles, so people who are unconverted, will come to the light. This is what will happen. So basically, what we can see here in Adventist speak, when the loud cry happens and the outpouring of the letter rain, which is what we are talking about here, this is what that happens. That's our Adventist speak, what we call those kind of events. Now, all, this, all that happens when the glory of the Lord lightens the earth. So in our church's history, the focus was largely on the law of God. In 1888, another message came. And this message was faith of Jesus or the righteousness of Jesus. Okay. So in the third selected messages, page 172, it says this, the third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus had not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness. And then she says in the next paragraph, the faith of Jesus is talked of but not understood. 
So what we are basically saying, we talked about a lot about the Ten Commandments, but the faith of Jesus has been largely not dwelt upon. So what have we missed? The message that was preached by A.T. Jones and, and uh, E.J. Wagner was exactly that message. What the faith, what, what righteousness of Christ or righteousness by faith. So you might, uh, you might be right in actually asking yourself, so what is righteousness? What does righteousness actually mean? So let's go directly to get a definition from Christ Object Lessons. It says, righteousness is right doing. And it is by their deeds that all will be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. The works show whether the faith is genuine. Do we agree with that statement? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what is righteousness? It is the right doing. And then also it says, the next paragraph, it says, whatever our profession, it amounts to nothing unless Christ is revealed in works of righteousness. So we could do whatever we want to do to make ourselves look good, but if Christ and his righteousness are not at the center of it, we miss the point. It all will be for nothing. It will be a wasted effort. So he who becomes partaker of the divine nature will be in harmony with God's great standard of righteousness, his holy law. This is the rule by which God measures the actions of men. This will be the test of character in the judgment. So what reveals our character? Is what we do, yeah? Okay, good one. So then we can say that righteousness by faith is really doing by faith. In other words, if the judgment of God is testing what we do, right doing, obviously not our right doing, it is right doing of Christ. And also it is not our right doing, it is his right doing. When both of these are done, keeping the commandments and having the faith of Jesus together, that means that it is righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. When these two things are exhibited, then we reflect the character of Jesus. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will claim, come and claim them as his own. So do we realize when we rejected this message, we actually delayed the, uh, the Christ coming? I'm saying we, I'm referring to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Yeah? Now, how many of us have prayed, oh, Jesus, please come, take us home? Have we prayed that? But have we missed something, though? Have we missed something? Okay. So, question becomes, how do we reproduce Christ's character in our own lives? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, 13 to 16. You can follow in your Bible, so you can follow on the screen. It says this, Till we all come in the unity of faith. So, God wants us to be in the unity of faith. Why is that important? Because it is the faith of Jesus, isn't it? So till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So who is the perfect man? So the Bible tells us Jesus is the perfect man. He, he wants us to grow in the full stature to be like him. Yeah? Okay, let's continue from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So why are we not no more children here? What does it say? Because we have grown up to reflect the stature of Christ. So the Bible here is telling us that God's desire for his, for his church is to move from childhood to adulthood which means that we are reflecting the image of Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, if the faith of Jesus is designed to grow us up and to make us no more children, then we as a church, when we rejected the message in 1888, it left us as children. Our growth was stunted. Sorry, I missed that one. Okay, so... If you, if you look at this in the first selected messages, it says, the law of, was our schoolmaster. And this is from Galatians 3.24. The whole issue, you know, the, the conflict in the early church was because of this passage, uh, Galatians 3.24 to 26. Which law are we referring to here? So that's where the kind of conflict was. And because of the conflict, people were rejecting the message. So the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Galatians 3.24. 
In this scripture, the Holy Spirit, through the apostle, is speaking especially of the moral law. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee to him for pardon and peace by exercising repentance towards God and faith towards Lord Jesus Christ. Even Ellen White identifies this as the moral law. This is what she says. I am asked concerning the law in Galatians. What law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both, the moral law and the ceremonial law. Now, let me ask you this. Who needs a schoolmaster, or in today's uh, terminology, who needs a principal? Students, children, yeah? Yeah, all who want to be taught. Okay, interesting. But children depend on the schoolmasters, don't they? But in Galatians 3.24, the schoolmaster, what does it do? It leads us to Christ. Okay, so once the schoolmaster has done his job, its work, the schoolmaster then hands you over to Christ. The problem is that we as Adventists have put so much emphasis on the law of God, attaining righteousness by the law of God. We kind of say, oh, do you keep Sabbath? Do you not kill? Do you not steal? Okay, you are righteous. That's what we do. But the Bible tells us there is something more to the law. And the end goal, there is something more that we, we should be striving for. We cannot attain righteousness through the commandments. You can only attain righteousness through the faith in Jesus. In our minds, we might be saying, yeah, 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 we know all that. But actually, I don't think we get it fully, generally speaking. I don't think we get it. Why do I say that? Let me explain. What is righteousness? It is right doing. So you are doing something. It's a positive action. What do the Ten Commandments tell us? No, it tells us what not to do, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what the Ten Commandments tell us. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't do this, don't do that, yeah? That's what they tell us. So what we don't do cannot possibly make up righteousness, which is right doing. And because we as a church have been so focused on righteousness through the commandments, we focus on the do-nots instead of the do. So we focus... So why... I, I, I just want to make it clear. The not, do not do is important, it really is. You cannot have one without the other. But I think we always had only half of the story. We didn't present the full story. I think that is the issue. We focus on the do not instead of what we should be doing. And as a church, because we are still children, because we didn't accept that message which was designed to grow us up in faith, in the faith of Jesus. And what is the faith? It is the righteousness of Jesus, isn't it? Righteousness of, or character of Christ. And what is character? Character is about what we do. So what we do is, is character, but because we rejected the message, we've been focused on what we don't do. So we say, and let, tell me if I'm wrong, we say, I don't eat meat, or I don't, eat, I don't I listen to this kind of music, I don't, I don't dress this type of clothes, I don't do this, I don't do that. How many times have you heard that within our church? I have heard it plenty of times. And because we focused on the law of God and not on the righteousness of Christ, we are still here. We don't understand what we are supposed to be doing as a church. So continuing in Galatians chapter 3, verse 25 to 27, it says, but after the faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. That's interesting. So we are no longer under the Ten, uh, ten Commandments. You know, we, you know, some people take it to the extreme and saying Ten Commandments no longer apply. And even though it is referring to ceremonial law and the, and the moral law here, the Ten Commandments, that is not what Paul is saying here. So this means that now that we realize my righteousness doesn't come from what I don't do, it comes from Jesus Christ and his righteousness, his righteous acts. That's what we need to understand. Verse 26, it says, For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. Listen to the next quote. The law of God has been largely dwelt upon and had been presented to congregations almost destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and, and his relation to the law, as was the offering of Cain. So Cain had absolutely no power because there was no Christ represented there, because there he was not following Christ. We are saying exactly the same thing here. We're doing the same mistake if we separate the faith of Jesus and the law, the Ten Commandments. So what does the law do? It simply tells us what not to do, as it is written in the Ten Commandments. It doesn't tell us what to do. 
We cannot be righteous by what we don't do. Righteousness is an action, and the Bible tells us that the only thing that the law does, it tells us what not to do. And even if you didn't do everything that the law says, guess what? You are still not righteous. Why? Because you can't be righteous, because it is Christ's righteousness that saves us, not, not our own righteousness. It has to be Christ's right doing. So God is waiting for the church to do right. We just focus on the law of God. Look, we don't do this, we don't do that. But the dead people don't do anything. And, uh, you know, are they saved? Not yet. A dead person keeps Sabbath every Sabbath because they don't work on the Sabbath. But listen, what happens in heaven? Do they think of law when they, when they, when they uh, obey God? Listen to this. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. So it's not about what I do or what I don't do. No, it's not about that. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. They actually couldn't even, you know, they didn't even think there was a law beforehand. But there was a law, wasn't there? And let's see why they didn't think there was a law. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their creator. Obedience to them is no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. So in every soul where in Christ, the hope of glory dwells. His words are re-echoed. I delight to do thy will. Yeah, thy law is within my heart. Now, isn't that beautiful? When we follow Jesus, we don't do it because I have to do this or I don't have to do that. We follow it because out of our love towards him, yeah? So in other words, it becomes a natural thing. I don't need Ten Commandments to tell me any longer do and don't do. Why? Because God has taken these commandments and has put them in my heart. So that it is natural for me to do those things. It is natural for me not to lie, not to steal, and not to kill. Righteousness comes by something that must be internal, and the only way that we can get that internally is to get Christ in us. Okay, so let me ask you. So you might say, oh, we know the Ten Commandments. How many of you want that faith of Jesus that the Bible talks about here? Does anybody want? Only about, uh, you know, three or four hands. Good to see. So I've got the commandments of God, we might say, but I want this faith of Jesus. I want that faith that works. Faith works by love. Faith manifested in the righteousness of Christ is manifested in the works of love. The law says don't do but the character of Christ says do. So in the essence, they go together. One tells us not to do, but the character of Christ shows us what to do. So let me read it to you. A legal religion is insufficient to bring the soul into harmony with God. The hard, rigid orthodoxy of the Pharisees, destitute of contrition, tenderness or love, was only a stumbling block to sinners. So the question is, the way we do a religion, is it a stumbling block to people who are out there? They were like the salt that had lost its savior, savor, sorry, for their influence had no power to preserve the world from corruption. The only true faith that which worketh by love, like in Galatians 5, 6, to purify the soul. It is as leaven that transforms the character. So how is the, the, how is the soul purified? It's through the works of love. Okay? So when we, st when we do what Jesus did, our character begins to be purified. He did the works of love. That's righteousness of Christ. Righteousness of Christ was manifested in what he did. Works of love. In doing that, something happens to the soul. It becomes purified. So let me ask you a question. Has anybody of you been to a fly and build or something overseas or something like this, or even storm cold trip or something like that? Anybody? One, two, a so couple of you. Three? Thank you. When you came back, how did you feel? Did you get paid for the work that you've done? Did you do it because you had to? You see what I mean? When we do acts of love to others, we come back transformed. This is how righteousness of Christ works. When we help others, we actually help ourselves. Okay. We cannot be justified because we don't lie or we don't steal or we don't commit adultery or covet. We are justified by the faith in the right doing of Jesus Christ. And when we begin to focus on the right doing of Jesus Christ, 
we will do as he did, which is going to manifest that our faith is genuine. Okay, so this is hard for us to hear. I know sometimes because we invested so much effort into preaching the Ten Commandments, and there is nothing wrong with that. But I think we missed the other half. We need the two halves to make it uh, full. We are so focused on ourselves that we don't do, that we forget to do. We say, oh, let's come to church, let's have programs for ourselves, let's do this, let's do that. Well, hang on a minute. If we help ourselves by helping others, where is the focus? Are we focusing internally on ourselves or are we focusing outwardly? Mission focus. You see, the perfection in Jesus was not in what he did not do. And when we have perfection discussions, we usually talk about how we overcome sin. I don't steal, I don't, uh, I don't commit adultery, I don't do this, I don't do that. I'm righteous. But there is so much more. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, do the acts of love, and those acts of love will purify your soul. In other words, Jesus is telling us to focus on him and do the things he tells us to do. And the works of love, in doing that, something will happen that will purify our soul. That it becomes natural for us not to do the things that the law says don't do. Don't get me wrong. I just want to repeat. I didn't say the Ten Commandments are no longer applicable. Yes, they are. But there are two parts to it. Okay? So see this quote from Review and Herald. It says, let us seek for that faith which works by love and purifies the heart, that we may represent the character of Christ to the world. So what is this really telling us? When we do acts of love, we are being transformed, and at the same time, we are witnessing to the world. So my question is, who are we concentrating here now? Are we concentrating on ourselves, or are we concentrating on, 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 on the world that God given us the big mission field out there? So let us seek for the faith that works by love. So when we begin to pour out, out of ourselves into the others, the oppressed, those that need help, when we pour out into others, what happens? We get transformed. Our hearts get transformed. The love of Christ working through us purifies our own hearts. We are trying to attain righteousness in a selfish manner. Instead of focusing on others, we are focusing on self. So Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So dear church family, Christ came to minister to the oppressed. And if we are not ministering to the oppressed, how can we expect to reflect the character of Christ? Because we have been so often focused on the law of God and not the righteousness of Christ, which is manifested in how we connect with the oppressed. We are still children. I'm talking about myself here. Still under a control, master not yet understanding the power of righteousness of Christ. John 17, 21 says, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So when the body of Christ, which is the church, comes unitedly and says, let's minister to those oppressed, we are going to be showing Christ to the world. That's when the world will know that the Christ is in us. Ellen White says this, and we need to focus on this. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with his glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. We have the entire, who, uh, when we have the entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by outpouring of his Spirit in a, in a, without measure. So basically, without measure. There will be so much Holy Spirit without measure. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. So here we go. We're starting to come to the crux. Uh, we are finishing soon. So what is the problem potentially with our own churches? Are we laborers together with God? Or are we coming to church looking inwardly, not outwardly? The way the church replicates the, uh, the character of God is by wholehearted consecration in the service of Christ. And what's the service of Christ? It's to minister to the oppressed. 
in the communities, to minister to the poor, any race, however you want to see it, young and old. The purpose of Christ on this earth was to set the captives free, to mingle with them as the one who desired their own good. And if we are not doing that, we are not laborers together with Christ. Can you imagine what the world would be like today if every Seventh-day Adventist church said, okay, let's get, get ourselves together and we're going to see how can we get teams into the community to minister to all those people that are, you know, whoever is, you know, people on the dole, people who might be, you know, uh, who might consider abortion, alcoholics, smokers, drug users, drug traffickers, you know, sex traffickers, whatever they are. If we say we're going to minister to all those people, this world will be a totally different place. Okay? Only Satan will say, oh, no, don't go out there, look at how bad those people are, you know, con you know, concern yourself about your own righteousness, don't worry about them. But only Satan would say that. So as you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and the labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of, of the spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. So by helping others, we help ourselves. And by helping ourselves, we prepare ourselves for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When we get the Holy Spirit, we become more like Christ, and we reflect the light of the world. Does that make sense? Everybody is very quiet or falling asleep. Okay, that's okay. So let's, let's see... This is the last uh, passage from, the, um, uh, from Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 8. It says this. Is, this not, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then, sorry, and then it says, then shall thy light break forth. So when does the light break forth? When we do what Isaiah 58 tells us to do, which is the acts of love to people out there. Okay? And it says... Then shall light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. My sermon is pretty much done. I hope that if you think about the, the children's story that I had, I really hope this is not, the, and I don't know very well the, the, the Jinjin church, but you know, if let's say somebody came who doesn't look like us in the, in the church, would it be like a three-meter radius around that person, or would we actually go there and actually make them feel welcome? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking the question. We keep on praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but the question is, are we ready to receive the Holy Spirit? Do we have that connection with Jesus that transforms us first, that we become enlightened people before we can share the light with people out there? And we keep on praying that for Jesus to come to take us home. But my question is, are we doing what Christ is telling us to do in order to hasten his coming so that he can return? That is my question. That's my challenge. And as we discussed in the lesson today, you know, today we need to make a decision. Am I going to be the person that actually does everything that they can with, with God's power to reach the people out there who are thirsting for the, for the truth? Or am I going to be one of those people that comes to church and says, give me, give me, give me, and then I go home, do my things the whole week, and then come back the next week, do the same thing. I really hope that everybody makes a decision today saying, God, yeah, I might not have been doing what, uh, what you asked us to do, but today I'm making a decision. I want to be different. I want to change. I, I hope and pray that that is your decision today as well. Amen. Okay.